Hey everybody, so we are, um, I'm not sure which order you are starting these GI videos. Um, my recommendation is, you can watch them in any order you want, but my recommendation is to watch the esophageal gastric disorders, which was the one we're on, um, and then the intestinal disorder, and then watch the liver disorders first, or the hepatic disorders, followed by the pancreatitis. That's my, or pancreas. Sorry, that's my suggestion. Um, but again, you can watch them in any order you want. Um, but if you're missing something, it's probably listed in one of the other lectures. All these systems kind of go together. So we're going to talk about the intestines, starting from the top and going down to the bottom, and talking about all the different things that we need to look for. Um, and these are focusing, the slides are focusing on the esophagus and the gastric disorders. Um, so we are just talking about, at this point, um, you know, the esophagus, the stomach. Uh, what we need to know about the stomach is that the stomach is supposed to be its own closed off little balloon bag there um, with sphincters at the top and the bottom. And the, ass, the stomach itself actually has a pH of zero to 5.5. So remember, normal human pH and normal human cells live at 7.35 to 7.45. So a pH of 0 to 5.5 is super acidic. Um, most things um, cannot live in that environment, and it does break down most things that hit that environment. So um, gastric cells then will actually secrete this, these acidic substances. Um, hydrochloric acid is the acid that our stomach secretes. Um, pepsin and gastrin are digestive enzymes. Um, they also, these cells are specialized that they secrete um, a bicarbonate-rich mucus that protects its stomach tissue from digestive enzymes. So of course we need bicarbonate in our system in order to create bicarbonate-rich mucus that cloaks coats the lining and keeps the stomach from eating itself or digesting itself. Um, so you can imagine that in low bicarbonate states or in acidosis and metabolic acidosis that our stomach is not getting the bicarb that it needs to do this and so we have trouble uh, later on, which we'll bring up later on. Um, but these two sphincters, the esophageal, is nicely named because it's at the end of the esophagus before the stomach, and the pyloric sphincter, which is at the bottom of the stomach, are supposed to keep the acids in the stomach and keeps the food in the stomach to interact with the acids and enzymes. So our big problems are when these sphincters don't work or when the acid gets outside of the stomach space or there is not enough bicarbonate-rich mucus, which will then expose the stomach cells to their own acids, which causes problems. So let's start at the beginning, which is at the bottom of the esophagus, um, and we're gonna talk about GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease. GERD and hiatal hernia, they both have the same symptoms, they have different pathophysiologies here. Um, but they have the same symptoms, so I kind of put them together. Um, GERD just means that that esophageal sphincter has dysfunctioned and allows acid to reflux up into the esophagus. A hiatal hernia is where a piece of the um, esophagus, a piece of the stomach, has actually herniated up through the diaphragm. So you can see in this um, picture here that this there's an opening where the esophagus enters down into, through the diaphragm. This is actually a diaphragm. This is a, the muscle that controls our breathing. So the esophagus is above the diaphragm and the stomach is below the diaphragm. So that's exactly where it's sitting. And this hole um, here is called the hiatus. And that is a hole in the diaphragm that is um, meant to pass the esophagus through. So when the esophageal sphincter is um, is dysfunctional, we have reflux. There's nothing wrong with the anatomy of the stomach or the esophagus. In a hiatal hernia, that means that some of the stomach, maybe it's a weak stomach muscle, maybe it's an over bloated stomach that's constantly been stretched out, or um, for some reason you have a weak diaphragm. Some reason the stomach has kind of bubbled up into the um, into the thoracic area, which is above the diaphragm. And um, now the esophageal sphincter is up here instead of under the diaphragm where it's supposed to be. And so the esophageal sphincter is up here and this whole area is actually stomach. 
So a hiatal hernia is where the stomach bulges up into the chest. Um, when that esophageal sphincter is not in its correct place, it has dysfunction as well. So that's why we have the same symptoms really, is because the esophageal sphincter is damaged in both cases. So let's talk about what our symptoms are. Belching. Um, gas is able to get up out of the sphincter. Usually all of the gases stay in our, um, in our stomach and in our intestines. But when this esophageal sphincter is not um, closing properly, um, gases and acids can get up out of the stomach. So belching is because gases are escaping the stomach. Heartburn is an actual physical burn. So imagine your arm laying out in Arizona sun for a couple of hours. It's going to burn. Um, your esophagus gets burned by the acid. So anything that increases the acid getting up into the esophagus is going to cause this burn. It's called heartburn, but it's really esophagus burn. The reason it's called heartburn is guess where your esophagus, it goes behind your heart. So it feels like your heart is burning, but it's actually your esophagus that's burning. Um, if I draw a little picture of um, your intestine here, um, let's see, I, I'm not going to draw a picture of your intestine. I'm actually really bad at drawing pictures of intestines. Let me go back and see. I don't have a picture of your digestive system from the top or the bottom. I'm not very good at drawing, but I'm going to go. So this is our little person here. And his esophagus is going to go down into his stomach here. Um, but what is happening is your heart is in front of that. So this is just so anatomically correct, guys. Enjoy this. Um, your heart is sitting in front of that and your diaphragm is sitting right here. So if you have um, reflux coming up into your esophagus, then um, let me draw the reflux in a different color here. If you have reflux coming up, it's going to be burning your esophagus right behind your heart, and it feels like your heart is having pain. It's not your heart. It is your esophagus that is burning. So, of course, after eating, when your stomach is full, much more risk of sloshing around in, in this inappropriately closing sphincter getting up into the esophagus. And um, it worsens when laying down because when you are laying down, um, all the all the a full stomach when you're laying down on a full stomach especially stuff sloshes up into the esophagus um, a chronic cough and that is just because I don't know if you've ever um, swallowed a chip the wrong way when your esophagus is disturbed it stimulates a lot of muscles um, in order to try and um, the smooth muscle there is being stimulated and that will actually stimulate your um, your diaphragm around there as well so the esophagus is um, kind of pulsating and trying to push this stuff out and it actually stimulates your diaphragm and causes you to cough. So it's kind of nerve innervation um, down there. So if I get rid of my um, reflux here, um, if you are irritating the diaphragm that is here, go back, make my little diaphragm picture, put my diaphragm back. If this is the diaphragm here, there's a whole bunch of nerves um, that are innervating the diaphragm and innervating that esophagus area. Those nerves get stimulated, and so you actually end up stimulating your diaphragm when you stimulate your esophagus, um, so you get a chronic cough. There's nothing in your lungs, um, but you can get a chronic cough, and that's due to nerve innervation. Chest pain is due to the fact that you are having reflux up into the um, esophagus, which is burning because it's right behind your heart. So the chest pain is not heart pain, but it feels like it is because it's right behind your heart. Frequent hiccups, again, because you are stimulating that um, diaphragm behind the, uh, or right there at the esophagus, and that will cause the diaphragm to spasm, giving you hiccups. So that explains our symptoms. These symptoms are usually worse after a large meal or um, at the end of the day when the stomach is full. Um, and it certainly is worsened if you um, lay down or it basically it hurts when the reflux is present because the esophagus is, is burning. Um, so again, these symptoms come and go. They're not usually constant and they're usually there when you are having the active reflux. Um, worsening cues are pretty rare. Um, 
well, actually, I'm not going to say rare. Bleeding or perforation is pretty rare. That means that um, basically that the esophagus has eroded away or made a hole in itself, and you are actually food that you eat and swallow instead of making it into the stomach um, is now, and some of this reflux is spilling into your thoracic cavity. So that is going to... Um, that is going to cause quite a bit of problems. So if you have perforation, let me um, draw my, my super excellent uh, drawing here. If you have perforation, so let's say um, we now, uh, let me draw and get rid of all these little extra drawings here. Um, we have a hole. So let's say that part of the esophagus has um, perforated. Then this is now anything that you are... Um, Anything that you eat, so this is like a hole. This is the perforation. Any reflux that comes out of the stomach now continues to burn, but actually kind of escapes into this thoracic area. So this is really his, um, this super well-drawn man, um, if this is his chest area. Then this is coming out, this is your diaphragm, and your lungs are here. So you can imagine that anything perforating and leaking hydrochloric acid into your thoracic space is going to cause um, quite a bit of problems. And the biggest problem is actually this acid kind of getting around the heart muscle does start to damage the heart muscle. So if you have worsening chest pain, um, that even after um, your NPO, that means that you probably have refluxed some acid into your thoracic cavity and the chest pain does not improve. Um, you can also get fever from the, um, the actual damage and inflammation of your lungs and your heart when you have perforation. That is pretty rare. Um, what is more common is Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer. So if we take our arm out in the Arizona sun and we burn it basically every day. So imagine if you're having reflux every night, um, you are basically burning your esophagus every night. Um, so let's say we took our arm out every day and laid it in the sun for an hour or two with no sunscreen on and your arm burns. And then the next day you do it again and your arm burns and your arm burns. You would not be very surprised to find out that you have cancer or um, a beefy red arm or a permanently damaged arm from burning it every single day. And that is what happens to the esophagus over time with untreated reflux is that the esophagus will change a little bit and um, become something known as Barrett's esophagus, which we talk about in a minute, or esophageal cancer. So that is the more common worsening cues of reflux or hiatal hernia. Um, you can have dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing. Um, if the esophagus is swollen, inflamed, infected, um, you will have trouble swallowing. There will always feel like there is something um, stuck in your esophagus. Um, weight loss because it hurts to swallow. It's hard to swallow. It's difficult to swallow. Um, hoarseness is coming from esoph um, these esophageal um, reflux could be so bad that it is getting up towards your vocal cords. Um, pain on swallowing or pain that radiates to the back. This is um, a sign that there is something in your esophagus or something burning through your esophagus or more pain than is normal with esophageal reflux or hiatal hernia. So again, um, bleeding and perforation is pretty rare, but Barrett's esophagus or esophageal cancer, it can happen um, with untreated GERD or hiatal hernia. So let's treat it so we don't end up with these. We'll talk about the worst case scenarios in just a bit, but let's treat this so we don't um, end up to the worst case scenario. So say you're belching a lot, you feel like you've got heartburn um, after a big meal. Um, most people will go straight to um, antacids, which are perfectly fine. All these um, treatments for, gust, for GERD and for hiatal hernia are available over the counter. But it's important that you know what you're doing when you decide to self-medicate yourself uh, for a problem. You can also get these prescribed by a physician um, as well. So we're going to tell you about each of them. Um, to find out if your problem is getting worse, though, what we are monitoring is definitely the pain level and location. If it's just happening for an hour or two after you eat and then goes away, they'll just call it um, GERD. 
Uh, the quality and timing, like I said, does it happen when you eat? Is it happening all the time? You know, is it painful to swallow or is it just burning after you eat? Um, are you actually throwing up any of the stomach acid? Do you have fevers with it? Um, those start pointing you towards problems. We have a ton of people that come in and they're so familiar with reflux symptoms and because reflux symptoms do feel like chest pain that um, they poo-poo their chest pain as having reflux symptoms. It does feel very similar when it's bad, bad reflux to cardiac pain and pressure. Um, again, the esophagus and the heart are right near each other, so it's hard for you to tell whether you're having reflux or whether you're having chest pain. And so we have many BMI people coming in and saying, I'm having a very bad attack of my GERD, and it turns out they're having an MI. So that pain is pretty um, specific, but usually happens right around a meal and goes away as you digest that meal and your stomach empties out. Um, it shouldn't be nonstop, not improving with time. Um, what you can do to fix it, and again, also somewhat diagnose it, um, antacids are quick. So when you talk about just a regular antacid, um, we're not talking about the H2 receptor blockers or the proton pump inhibitors. They are antacids as well. Um, but we're talking about the quick acting things that neutralize stomach acid. So you can imagine that you have an idea of what's in most of these quick acting antacids is bicarb. So what's in Maalox, Mylanta, Rolaids, Tums are mostly bicarb of some kind. And when you eat something that has a lot of bicarbonate in it, it neutralizes your stomach acid. It does not change your stomach cells. So it is um, a quick fix, um, will help people feel better. And it is something that they will try um, if you are having extreme heartburn to take a couple of antacids because antacids should not help cardiac chest pain, but they will help GERD and reflux. So they are there as a quick relief, but again, once they finish neutralizing the stomach acid, if the stomach secretes more acid, then that antacid is gone. So you can have people that eat tons and tons. Um, I've had friends that will kick back and take three or four at a time of Tums for an entire night. And you're like, if it keeps coming back, all you're doing is masking the problem, and actually you can give yourself metabolic alkalosis by eating too many Rolaids, Tums, Maalox, Mylanta, because you're eating bicarb, basically. It neutralizes the acid, um, provides a temporary quick fix, but it really does not stop the stomach from producing the acid. So we do have two meds that physically block acid production, and they are known as H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors, always um, known as H2s or PPIs. Um, the proton pump inhibitors are well known as PPI, and you know these are just H2 blockers. Um, if you are on one, that should be enough. You should not be on both. You don't want to double block acid secretion. The higher the dose, the more acid blocking you have. So these do not block complete acid production. They are dose dependent. Um, H2 receptor blockers basically are taken twice a day and proton pump inhibitors are taken once a day. So H2 receptor blockers are Q12 hours um, and proton pump inhibitors are Q day, so every 24 hours. Um, they're Again, they block acid production for 12 hours, not just neutralize it real quick and then disappear. Um, they will block acid production for 12 or 24 hours, and then that will allow the time for the esophagus to heal. Now, of course, you're not going to be digesting as well. If you're blocking acid production, you don't have as much acid available in your stomach. Your gastric pH will go up. Um, it does change your um, gastric environment. But in order to let the esophagus heal, um, they are our primary interventions. So the other thing that you can do is basically avoid the reflux. You can block the acids, um, which we do have a little bit about both of those more common ones. We don't recommend taking antacids except as a every occasional um, 
treatment. It shouldn't be a constant antacid use. You should be moving over to an H2 blocker or PPI if you're having problems with GERD or hiatal hernia. Um, sit upright for two hours after meals. Let that stomach digest, churn, do its stuff and dump everything into the intestine before you lay down or lay back um, in your recliner because the flatter you lay, the more um, of that stuff can reflux. Avoid eating three hours before bedtime because, of course, most people lay flat to sleep, so you want plenty of time for that stomach to empty out before you go to sleep. Small, frequent meals, large meals create a great amount of acid, trying to break up a large amount in the, assess uh, the stomach. The stomach distended on top of a ton of acids will create reflux, whereas if you're eating a smaller meal, um, maybe, you know, a tiny piece of steak and and um, a salad, that's going to create a lot less acid. There's a lot less food for the stomach to deal with versus if you're going for your you know, appetizer, your steak, your baked potato, your dessert, um, that is going to put a lot more food in your stomach and much more for it to deal with at one time. Um, caffeine drinks, alcohol, chocolate, peppermint all increase the um, acidity of the stomach. Um, stop smoking. Um, when you inhale cigarette smoke, um, you do inhale it into your trachea, but a lot of that residue sits on your esophagus, and smoking is a high, high uh, risk factor for esophageal cancer as well as lung cancer. Um, so the tar and the nicotine and um, whatever chemicals are in cigarettes, vapes, um, uh, wax pens, dabs, whatever they are, any kind of smoking. We're not talking about just cigarettes. We're talking about any inhaling substances. Um, you would want to stop using those because they will uh, worsen damage to your esophagus. Eat slowly. Chew foods well. That means that the stomach doesn't have to do as much breaking down if you have broken it down in your mouth. So that's why your mom always told you, slow down, chew your food a hundred times because if you eat slowly, chew your food, don't gulp a lot of air, and you provide the stomach with already chewed up food and you didn't gulp a lot of air with it, then the stomach does not distend as much. Um, H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors, your most common side effect with those is headache. Uh, and H2 blockers, usually because they're Q12 hours, you'll take them with the first meal of your day and then right before your evening meal, at least a half an hour before your evening meal for it to work the best. If you take your H2 blocker after your meal, your stomach has already produced a ton of acid trying to break down that meal. So you need to take it before your meal so that it blocks the acid production before your food hits the stomach. As soon as you start chewing your food, acid production begins in your stomach. So if you are taking something to block stomach acid, you want to take it before you eat food. Um, now with breakfast, they say you take it with the first meal of the day. Um, it will last through lunch and then take it right before your evening meal. Um, and with PPIs, you want to take those as well 30 minutes before the first meal and it will last 24 hours. Um, there are a few more side effects with the proton pump inhibitors um, involving um, digestion and nausea. I'm not sure why it does itching. Um, but both uses of these blockers can cause B12 deficiency because the stomach cells secrete um, something that binds to B12 so that it can be absorbed later on in the stomach. It's called intrinsic factor. The stomach cells secrete this intrinsic factor, and it has been shown that H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitors um, do block some of this intrinsic factor, and long-term use can cause a B12 deficiency. Um, so anyway, that's a little bit about our antacids. They will be most of our treatments for most of our gastric problems. Um, Barrett's esophagus, I said we would talk a little bit about that. Barrett's esophagus is uh, precancerous changes of the esophagus tissues. It does not mean you have a, uh, cancer yet. Um, but left untreated, um, these are precancerous cells. They are cells that are different. So you can see on the picture here of the Barrett's esophagus, you can see that all the cells are supposed to be pink and beautiful, but now we've got some red, um, probably burned scar tissue kind of areas. And so anytime we have a change in the cells, they worry about um, a cancer being born from those cells. So again, symptomatic acid reflux for more than five years usually starts changing the esophagus esophagus, and I wrote the symptoms again there. There's nothing new here that's just having symptomatic acid reflux. Um, the worsening cue of Barrett's esophagus is that it develops to esophageal cancer. Um, 
and esophageal cancer, again, does not have ridiculously different signs and symptoms, but Dow, there, it just basically, when you have a tumor in your esophagus, you constantly have something in there. It hurts to swallow. It feels like you have a chip lodged in your throat at all times. You actually do have something lodged in your throat. It's a tumor. Um, dysphagia um, means difficulty swallowing, so it's hard to swallow food and get it to move past that um, tumor. Um, difficulty swallowing, um, they may have weight loss because they're not eating as well. Um, and every time you swallow, not only is it difficult, but it hurts. And that pain will radiate around to the back. That is basically something pressing on the esophagus. And the esophagus is pretty well innervated. And um, you feel pain in your esophagus pretty readily. Um, and, you know, if anyone's ever swallowed a Tostito or a chip the wrong way or a Dorito, you know exactly what it feels like. It feels like something ripping all the way down. And even though after you've gotten that food in your stomach, you know it's gotten through there. It still feels like it's lodged in there. Um, that is what a, a esophageal cancer would feel like or a tumor in there, but it would not go away. Um, it's a tumor. It's in there blocking the esophagus. So we want to take care of Barrett's esophagus when they see those changes. Um, and really what they're going to do is they're going to control your reflux, again, with all of the same things you would do for GERD or hyenal hernia. Um, you want to acid reduce and reduce reflux. Um, and then there are two treatments that they can do to get rid of those precancerous cells. Um, they can heat them away, called radio frequency ablation, which they will do with an endoscope, which is a scope put down your mouth through your into your esophagus, and then they will burn off those damaged cells, kind of like getting a facial peel. They burn off those um, cells, and then uh, they will grow back normal. Um, there is a surgery treatment as well, which is where they will remove the damaged piece of the esophagus and then wrap the um, wrap the top or the fundus of the stomach around the esophagus to support a uh, lower esophageal sphincter. It's called a fundoplication, fundoplication, and it's called a Nissen fundoplication. Um, but anyway, because Dr. Nissen came up with it. But um, it is a gastric surgery. They can do some of these fundoplications um, laparoscopically, not big, huge open surgeries, but um, it is something that they will remove a piece of the um, the esophagus, or they don't even have to remove the esophagus. Sometimes they will do the fundoplication to support the esophageal sphincter. But usually we're not going to get into surgery options for GERD or hiatal hernia unless it is causing a Barrett's esophagus. Um, they will try to take care of most of these items with an NS, with your H2 blockers, your proton pump inhibitors, or reflux avoidance. And then if necessary, if you are continuing to have reflux, even after following all these directions um, on how to avoid reflux and you're taking your, a your H2 blockers and your proton pump inhibitors, then they will consider surgery. And usually by this point, it's because you have Barrett's esophagus, meaning precancerous cell changes. Um, and usually a Barrett's esophagus, the causes are just having acid reflux plus something else that usually damage the esophagus. Just having GERD itself um, doesn't usually lead to having precancerous changes, um, but if you have other things that damage your esophagus as well, uh, smoking, like I said, why we have alcohol use um, does damage the esophagus itself. Um, really, alcohol is not a, um, it's a toxin, um, and it does burn the esophagus as it goes down a little bit, so it could cause that, especially combined with reflux, um, some changes. Obesity, because your stomach is getting pushed up towards that area, causing more reflux. Age greater than 50, our sphincters don't work as well the older we get, so some of these things um, combined with having GERD um, will cause Barrett's esophagus. Um, so we just want to keep avoiding reflux, take your H2 blockers or your proton pump inhibitors, and reduce your risk factors to keep it from progressing.
If you do end up with esophageal cancer, again, um, this will lead to a chronic cough. There is something down there that innervation is being is stimulating the diaphragm, a chronic cough. Frequent pneumonias because the inflammation around the esophagus does leak into your... So again, the frequent pneumonias are due to the inflammation happening around the esophagus. Um, really, whenever we have a foreign body or something that the... Um, the body, the immune system is trying to take care of, it will come in and attack and create a lot of swelling around here. And remember, we've got those, the heart here and the lungs here. So if we've got our heart and lungs in front of it, some of the swelling does kind of leak into the lung space, causing frequent pneumonias. Um, so esophageal cancer and all the swelling around that tumor can leak into the lungs, causing pneumonias. Of course, pain on swallowing, pain that radiates to the back, hoarseness, feeling of pressure, something stuck in the esophagus. And if the tumor is large enough and completely blocking the esophagus, you'll vomit undigested food. You could have blood um, in your cough or blood in your vomit, which is hemoptysis and hematoemesis. Hemoptysis is blood when you cough, and hematoemesis is blood when you throw up, and that could be bleeding from the tumor that is now when you cough, that blood is getting up into the back of your mouth and coming out with your sputum, and it is coming up when you vomit. Um, and then if it metastasizes, it likes to metastasize to um, the liver and to the bone marrow and to the lymph system. So um, if you're having the above symptoms plus some other problems, you definitely want to go in and get seen because the most common metastases for esophageal cancer is liver, lymph system, and bones. Um, so again, the treatment for it is going to be, if it's a small tumor, you can excise that or remove it through an endoscopy. And if it is a larger tumor, they will go in and they could do an esophagectomy, which is a removal of some or all of the esophagus. And then the stomach is pulled up um, through the hiatal area or through the hiatus to join to the remaining esophagus. If you've had to remove your entire esophagus, they may harvest part of your colon or small bowel to ex to join the two together, um, to make it extension tubing, basically. Um, but after the esophagectomy, the patient no longer has an esophageal sphincter, so they will have to eat sitting uh, upright um, afterwards because not only now do you have, if they do cut some of this out um, for esophagectomy, let's say we cut all of this out and they need to bring this stomach up, you're gonna end up pulling all of this stuff up and stretching it. And so your stomach itself, the storage area of it becomes much, much smaller. It becomes kind of one long tube because the extra pouching of your stomach has been pulled up to create um, an esophagus there. Um, and then they'll do radiation and chemotherapy after tumor removal. Um, so we have later on in the in the PowerPoint, care of the patient post endoscopy that will go for any endoscopy procedure, whether it's for GERD or for just looking at the esophagus in the stomach. Um, esoph endoscopy procedures um, are just a scope down through the mouth, but at the end of that scope, um, they do have tools that they can do surgeries and biopsies and things on. So we do have care of the patient post endoscopy. We do have care of the patient post any kind of gastric surgery, um, depending on whatever you need. So if they need to go in and have any part of their stomach manipulated or cut, that will be considered gastric surgery. And um, anything that is done um, scope-wise endoscopy, that would be um, care of the patient post endoscopy. So let's talk about some ulcers now. So we talked about actually damage to the esophagus. Now we're going to move into the stomach and talk about ulcers. Um, peptic means stomach. Pep pepsin is one of the um, digestive enzymes that the stomach produces. So peptic is usually meaning stomach. If you hear anything peptic, think stomach. Um, I like to think peptobismol is for my stomach, and so peptic is stomach. Um, and peptic ulcers or ulcers in your stomach are usually related to H. pylori, which is a bacteria that loves acidic environments. 
Um, most bacteria cannot live in your stomach because the pH is 0 to 5.5. Um, I We couldn't live in our own stomach. Um, but H. pylori is a bacteria that loves and thrives in the acidic environment. So if your stomach gets colonized with this bacteria, it will... Um, eat through and create ulcers, or um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories cause ulcers. There's a whole um, uh, picture down there on how it does it. I don't need to know that you um, know how it does it, but things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories erode your gut. That is very true. Um, peptic ulcers themselves can hurt, but they can also bleed. So you can just have um, actual damage to your stomach wall that hurts, or it can bleed. Um, the other kind of ulcer is a stress-related ulcer. And um, again, don't memorize this slide. It's just basically saying that uh, any illness that causes a decrease in your bicarb, a decrease in your blood flow to your stomach, decreased motility of your intestines, um, can cause a stress ulcer of your stomach because then it's not receiving the blood flow and the bicarbonate that it usually makes to protect itself and the stomach can't protect itself from its own acid juices and it starts to kind of erode itself. So any usually after surgeries, any big stress on the body, um, any trauma, um, it doesn't have to be dramatic. Um, you are at high risk of a stress-related ulcer and that is not due to any bacteria or any non-steroidal drug use. It's just due to stress. Um, and this is the more common stress ulcers that everybody in nursing school thinks you have a stress ulcer. Um, and hey, maybe some of you do have a stress ulcer. Let's talk about what ulcers feel like. Um, it is pain in the stomach, not pain up in the heart. Um, gastric pain is burning or gnawing. And since your stomach sits right below the diaphragm, it's in your upper stomach. It usually occurs one to three hours after food, of course, when the acid is highest. And overnight and early morning when your stomach doesn't have anything to counteract the acid, basically. Um, the pain does get relieved by foods or antacids or actually getting rid of the acid out of your stomach by vomiting. Um, and that is, you know, that is kind of how you tell the difference. But it is, um, you could have weight or appetite loss with it because your stomach is hurting. It's not sending out signals that it wants to deal with anything right now. Um, worst case is you have pain. You get it treated, you take, uh, you take your treatments, you take your antacids, you get rid of the H. pylori, you stop taking non -steroidals. Whatever you need to do to treat the cause of your um, ulcers, um, we hope that it does not get to the point that it creates bleeding. Um, ulceration itself isn't an automatic bleed, but an ulcer that goes deep enough and erodes through the blood vessels of the stomach can start to bleed. Um, and also ulcerations that eat through the stomach wall can cause perforation um, of the stomach, meaning that stomach contents are now spilling out into your abdominal cavity, not your thoracic cavity like the esophagus. The esophagus is up behind our heart and our lungs. The stomach is below the diaphragm, and anything that spills out of there will go into our abdominal cavity. Um, so severe pain, uh, so basically an upper GI bleed, the first time we're going to see that, well, there's two ways we can see a GI bleed from your stomach, is that you could actually throw up bright red blood. Um, usually a stomach sore, we talk about GI bleeding in a little bit, but um, coffee ground emesis is blood that's been curdled by acid, basically, and it becomes coffee grounds. It actually looks like literal black coffee grounds that you have just brewed out of your coffee pot. Um, and that is the red blood cells have been curdled by stomach acid, and then you throw those up. If you have bright red blood, that stomach has not seen stomach acid and actually um, comes out bright red. So you, will th you could throw up your blood, bright red blood or coffee ground blood. Both of those are blood that you're throwing up, or the blood could just be digested which turns into black tarry stools. The longer the blood is in the intestine, the more the blood gets digested and turns dark and black. Um, so sometimes patients just have darker stools, don't report it, um, think it's just a normal change in stool, um, and have been bleeding 
for quite a while, but they've never actually thrown up blood because if the stomach just dumps the blood um, into the intestine, it will come out the other end. Um, so you can have not uh, vomiting, which would be bright red or coffee ground, or you could have stools, which would be black and tarry, meaning sticky, um, black sticky stools. Um, anemia, of course, of how long the bleed's been going on and how big the bleed is. And um, blood urea nitrogen is actually created by the liver when we break down blood. So when we digest that blood, um, the blood urea nitrogen actually will go up. So you have a higher circulating BUN and it has nothing to do with your kidney. It has everything to do that just we're making more waste. The body is digesting more blood. Um, so those are signs of the upper GI bleed, which would be from your stomach. And then um, if the stomach does ulcerate through to it perforates, then you will get a infection of your um, abdomen. And just like a infection of your abdomen that we talked about when you have perineal dialysis, any infection in your abdomen has the same symptoms, a high fever, firm, rigid, kind of almost distended abdomen, not fully distended out like a soft balloon, but so tight and rigid um, and severe pain in all four quadrants. So that if you touch any of their four quadrants on their abdomen, there is pain in all four quadrants because the whole area is infected. So those would be our worsening cues of a peptic ulcer. Is it eroding through and bleeding or eroding through and creating a hole in your stomach? So we don't want it getting there. So what are we going to do? Acid blockers. Um, we'll keep an eye on the pain level and location. Again, if it starts to um, create more pain, pain in four quadrants, then we know that we have something worse going on. Um, definitely check any vomit or stool for blood if your patient is complaining of gnawing abdominal pain. Um, it does not hurt to check the stool for any, um, any occult blood or blood that's hiding in the stool. Um, keep an eye on the blood rate, heart rate, temperature for any kind of bleeding, and they may want to watch the hemoglobin hematocrit and the BUN level to see if there's bleeding going on. Um, if there's no signs of bleeding or peritonitis, then it's just acid reduction. Again, it's either due to non-steroidal or H. pylori um, and so, or, um, or stress. So we will, in the meantime, while the stomach is sorting out what's wrong with it, we want to decrease the acid in the stomach so that it does not keep eroding itself. Um, if the ulcer is caused by H. pylori, it's usually antibiotics. And Pepto-Bismol has been found to um, actually inhibit H. pylori growth. So they'll put you on antibiotics, a specific antibiotic um, that works for H. pylori, and they will do Pepto-Bismol for the pain because that actually inhibits H. pylori growth. Um, so if it's the bacteria, you will be treated with antibiotics. If it's stress or non-steroidals, um, either one will get, an will get acid reduction, but non-steroidals will need to be stopped before it erodes to bleeding. Um, so again, if there's signs of GI bleeders, we're still not going to stop our treatment for the ulcer. Um, they'll still get acid reducers. And the other thing about acidic environments is remember our cells don't work well, including our clotting factors and our red blood cells. Um, clotting factors get inactivated in the gastric acid environment. So a, G a, a stomach ulcer doesn't stop bleeding because the environment is acidic. So acid reducers are very important to continue even though um, they are bleeding because we do want that blood to clot off and clotting factors don't work in a pH of five or less. Um, so getting that stomach environment less acidic will help you clot blood. Um, in the meantime though, while you are, if you are having a bleed, you'll need fluid replacement. It's, either, it's isotonic. Um, they'll send them to endoscopy to find the source and control the bleeding. They can cauterize the bleed. They can, um, they can burn that ulcer and get it to stop bleeding. Um, they could find the source, see how much. Um, basically, the, any patient with a GI bleed is going to find themselves an endoscopy um, to look for the source of the bleeding, and you'll be taking care of them post-endoscopy. Um, they'll get blood product replacement if their H&H &H is low enough, and if none of that really works or they can't control the bleeding or the bleeding is so severe, there are a couple of meds that we can use that will reduce blood flow to the stomach and the esophagus to stop the bleed. 
but again, they're risky. Um, I don't know if you've worked on any of the floors, you may see that octreotide, it only works on blood flow to the stomach and the esophagus. Um, I don't remember what it's first, it's an off-label use of octreotide. I don't remember what its real use is for. I've only given it for GI bleeds. Um, but anyway, that will reduce the blood flow to the stomach, reducing the velocity of the bleed. But again, it's not a good choice to reduce blood flow to your intestinal system. You can have damage to the stomach and the uh, intestinal system from using these vasoconstrictors. But if it's the only way to stop a bleed, um, then they will try it. Um, it's kind of a last-ditch effort. Usually acid reduction, fluid replacement, going and getting the source of the bleeding under control, those top three do work. Um, we'll just get some blood replacement, and hopefully that is the end of the scenario. Um, but again, just so you know, there are two drugs out there that will cause vasoconstriction to the stomach and esophagus. Um, any kind, stop NSAIDs right away. Even if you they were not NSAID related, if you are prone to any kind of ulcer, you do not want to add non-steroidal anti-inflammatories to it, um, avoiding irritants, and of course, stress and smoking reduction. So we're just going to talk a little bit about the procedures. There is a video. Let me just double check that. Oh, well, let me know if the link does not work. It should be a an actual, so you can watch the video. Usually um, in block three, we try to send people to endoscopy when they go to the hospital um, as one of their observation areas, but we haven't been in hospital. So um, hopefully that endoscopy video, video works so that you can see kind of what the endoscopy um, shows you. It is expected afterwards there. Can, you can see that they're putting the camera down your mouth through your esophagus and into your stomach. The uh, um, endoscopy uh, I don't want to say hose, the endoscopy um, scope, sorry, it's a scope. The endoscopy scope will is long enough to make it into the duodenum, which means past the stomach. So it can do a little bit of the small intestine, um, but it's not long enough. Eventually you'll get to the hilt of the scope and that really ends right at the, um, in the duodenal area. So it's enough length to get you down through your mouth, through your esophagus, through your stomach, and into the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. Um, it is normal. It, this You do get sedation for this. Um, I don't think I would want to be fully aware and awake. You are not under anesthesia. You are under conscious sedation, so you are conscious and you could talk, but you don't remember it. Um, you're pretty well out. Um, they usually use something like Versed and maybe a little bit of pain medicine um, to just chill you out. Um, but you know, they are putting a tube down your throat into your stomach. It is normal to feel a sore throat afterwards. Um, if they did a biopsy or did any kind of interventions where there was some bleeding, um, you may see some of that bleeding come up when you cough. Um, it's not coming out of your lungs. It's coming out of your stomach and esophagus. But because after you cough, you kind of propel it into the back of your throat, it looks like it's coming up with your sputum. Um, but it is probably bleeding post-endoscopy. As long as it's light pink and not bright red in large amounts, that is normal. Um, it does hurt to swallow afterwards, um, and that is normal as well. It is not expected to have extensive bleeding afterwards. They should have either found the source, um, or sometimes they do biopsies, sometimes they do procedures in there. It is not normal to bleed afterwards, so if they are coughing up large amounts of blood or vomiting bright red blood, um, that is something that I would want you to notify the physician for because they should have fixed that, not caused bleeding. They should be fixing that. Um, there is a chance when you are shoving a, um, a scope down and they can see what they're doing as they advance it, but there is a chance that you could puncture through the esophagus or through the stomach with that scope. Um, if you have any severe chest pain, fever, chills, increased white blood cells, that could be the sign of an infection. Um, Again, the esophagus goes behind the heart, so sometimes when you stimulate the esophagus and that nerves, it's the esophageal nerves that cause the problem here. The esophageal nerves are the same nerves that innervate your heart and your diaphragm. So those nerves are, you know, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic system, the rest digest. Um, 
that's there to be stimulated when you swallow food. It stimulates the parasympathetic system, but when you stimulate when you ugh, stimulate the parasympathetic system, it does affect your respiratory rate and your heart rate as well. So you may see some cardiac arrhythmias, which would basically be like bradycardias or blocks or slowing down the heart rate usually. Um, respiratory depression, over sedation, um, those are things that are not expected. Um, really just because of our, what we don't expect is what we're watching. We're um, always looking out for any kind of bleeding, pain in the uh, esophagus. It should not be painful. You should just have a little sore throat. No foods or food until you have a gag reflex. Again, because you're sedated and numbed um, so that you don't gag out the scope, then um, that sedation numbness might last for a little while. So no food or fluids until your gag reflex has returned. Um, they can have lozenges, warm saline goggles for the, gargles for the sore throat and let the physician know of any complications. Um, most, most of these procedures um, are outpatient procedures, but you should have someone take you uh, home afterwards if it's outpatient. Um, they could have the sore throat for up to three to four days. They're just supposed to do saline gargles. And again, like you would notify the physician of any infection, bleeding, um, you, the patient should notify the provider as well if they're going home. And gastric surgery. This is for any surgery of the esophagus or the stomach for whatever reason. Um, if they've had gastric surgery, either laparoscopic or midline incision, um, they will probably have an NG tube afterwards. So most of these surgeries, if they have done something where they have cut the stomach or cut the esophagus and put things back together, there are sutures holding that in place, which you don't want those sutures getting distended or pressurized because then they will pop. So we don't want anything to pop. So they might have an NG tube in, which is, you know, through the nose into the stomach to suction. And the NG tube will basically be a gentle suction, not a strong suction, a gentle suction to pull any air or gases out of the stomach so that you don't get distended because distension of the stomach after surgery could cause suture problems. Um, NPO until bowel sounds return. They could have epigastric aching and burning. They did just cut that area, so it's not abnormal to have pain from that area. It's not abnormal to have JP drains, um, which are Jackson Pratt drains, the ones that go to the little bulbs, um, to help you, um, to help remove any drainage that they didn't drain. One of the sp specific for gastric surgery, or whenever you've manipulated the stomach, um, is dumping syndrome. We don't love it. We kind of expect it because if the stomach has been stunned or operated on, basically the stomach is in control of releasing small amounts of food through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum. If the stomach has been stunned, anesthetized, um, uh, revamped, pulled up through the diaphragm, whatever we're doing to it, the stomach muscles um, are not as good at controlling the amount of food being dumped into the duodenum. So dumping syndrome is where large amounts of food get dumped into the duodenum more than it's used to handling and actually cause like a, va a, a dilation of the duodenum. It basically um, causes that duodenum to get over distended, over full. And that's a small intestine. It's not supposed to be very full. It's supposed to have small little bits given to it. And if you dump a whole stomach's worth into the duodenum, um, it also stimulates that uh, parasympathetic innervation and will cause nausea, vomiting, cramps, diarrhea, dizziness, um, palpitations. They will also have some tachycardia and sweating with it. So any patient that's had gastric surgery um, this is even right after gastric surgery or even months after gastric surgery. If the stomach has never recovered to be able to control how much get dumped into the duodenum, um, patients may realize that if they eat too large of a meal, it will entirely get dumped into the duodenum and cause dumping syndrome. So it's not like something's gone wrong with the surgery, but it's just something that the stomach is no longer as effective at doing what it used to do, which was control movement into the small intestine. Um, so we expect it. We don't love it, but it's not a complication of surgery. It is um, something that patients need to be made aware of and so they can change their habits. Um, 
We certainly don't want any sutures that the surgeon spent so much time putting in and taking care of to rupture or fail. They get very angry, surgeons do. Um, and sometimes things fail just because things fail, um, but sometimes things fail because we didn't maybe keep suction on the NG tube or we let the patient do something they weren't supposed to do. Um, so definitely we want to make sure, and then of course any suture failure or anastomosis means two pieces joined together. Um, any failures of those could cause leaking of gastric contents into the abdomen, or if it's in esophageal surgery, those sutures rupturing could cause leakage of contents into the thoracic space. Um, so all of those things could cause um, pain, distension, um, and one of the things that causes it isn't so much just letting stomach get distended by abdominal distension, but dry heaving and vomiting causes pressure and strain on those sutures. So they really want to control patients' dry heaving, vomiting, um, and nausea after gastric surgery because we don't want to break anything that we just fixed. Um, again, infection is a risk after any surgery, but it will be infection due to... Um, the area that was manipulated. So if they were manipulating the stomach, that's in the um, abdominal area. And if it is in the esophagus and you're doing your sutures, your anastomosis up in the esophagus, you could have infection of your um, thoracic area. More common though to have the abdominal area and again, peritonitis, the signs and symptoms are the firm, rigid, distended abdomen. Patient won't let you touch anywhere on the abdomen, pain in all quadrants, high fever. Um, bleeding. Any gastric surgery, any abdominal or intestinal surgery, if you are bleeding in your abdominal space, it's hard to see. The abdominal space can hold a lot of fluid. So you could be bleeding in your abdominal space and not have any signs or symptoms. The signs and symptoms that you will have, that you will see, will be late. But they will be um, Turner and Cullen sign. And I had a picture of that somewhere. Um, but Turner and Cullen sign, I guess I don't have my picture on this page. So... Um, Turner is um, flank bruising, and so I think we had the picture of Turner and Cullen sign in your um, renal um, thing because that was a sign of kidney bleeding as well, um, Turner sign, and Cullen sign is around the umbilicus. So if you have any bruising, sorry, on your flank, any bruising around your umbilicus, um, again, that means there's a huge collection of blood that's now kind of, and a lot of people have flank bruising because they're laying on their back. And so where is the blood going to settle? On the back side, and it'll settle on the backs and the sides. So it'll be Turner sign usually. Um, and then sometimes we don't see it at all until the blood pressure goes down and the heart rate goes up, meaning you are dry. And that could be because you're bleeding into your abdomen and we couldn't see it. Um, risk of pneumonia is because they are... Um, after gastric surgery, can you imagine what's happening to the diaphragm? I should put that under there. Um, one more thing that we expect that I'm going to add here is atelectasis. And that is due to um, diaphragm manipulation. It's hard to do surgery right under an important breathing muscle. Um, so a lot of patients will have a... Um, a sore diaphragm after that surgery it won't take big deep breaths. It kind of hurts to take a big deep breath in. Atelectasis means collapse of the lower lobes of the lung, and that can lead to pneumonia. And then, of course, DVT for being um, NPO, still in bed, um, not getting up and wandering around. Um, both the treatments for atelectasis would be to get up and walk around. Um, treatment for DVT, get up and walk around, keep things moving. Um, but that's what those complications are from. Um, we would want to make sure they stay NPO until bowel sounds resume. Again, because we did surgery on the stomach area, um, we want to advance the diet slowly to prevent stress on suture lines. So clear liquid and then full liquid for a couple of weeks and then a soft diet. So very slowly. This isn't just clear liquids for a day and then full liquids for a day. This is a slow, you're going to have a liquid or soft diet for almost three weeks after surgery. Um, and then they will be eating small, frequent meals. Um, educate about dumping syndrome. As long as that stomach is not processing food the way it normally would, you're at risk for dumping syndrome. Could be just until the stomach recovers in a couple of weeks. Could be for the rest of their life. Um, 
they'll be getting prophylactic antibiotics. Any bowel surgery, stomach surgery, esophagus surgery is going to get antibiotics. It's a dirty place, a non-sterile place, and so cutting into those areas is a risk for infection. So prophylactic antibiotics, um, deep venous uh, DVT prophylaxis, um, cough, deep breathe, get rid of that atelectasis. Um, early ambulation should be on there as well. They should be getting up out of bed and ambulating around. It will help the bowels move faster. Um, it will stimulate those bowels to... Did I just spell ambulate with an E? I'm sorry. Um, but it will help the bowel sounds return better. It will um, relieve atelectasis, prevent pneumonia. Um, nausea control is going to be very important. They may um, not wait for them to get nauseous before handing them nausea control meds. Um, very important to avoid vomiting and dry heaving on your patient to prevent suture problems. Um, and I think that might be, and then there's a little more about dumping syndrome, what you can teach your patient. Again, um, we don't want the stomach just dumping everything into duodenum. You want to have them know that if they're having palpitations or sweating, um, or nausea, um, after they, you know, after they're eating and it can happen anywhere from fifth, you know, 15 minutes to two hours, um, after eating food, um, treat dumping syndrome, we certainly don't want them getting gas buildup in their stomach. Um, and then also reflux. Once you're doing stomach surgeries, um, you've probably messed up one or two or both of the sphincters that are involved there. So anti-reflux um, treatments as well, keeping things out of the stomach that could damage the stomach or um, the sutures, um, no bending straining. And so that is it for this one. Um, I will see you again in the intestine lecture.